Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to see everyone uh, here and this morning after the City Hall party, so thank you for, for showing up at 10. Um, uh, so, so uh, my name is Keith Katz. I'm co-founder of Execution Labs. Um, I just wanted to quickly tell you about uh, what we do there because it really has bearing on what we're going to discuss here. And then mostly I want these guys to do the talking. But um, I think because we're a relatively small group uh, throughout this, if you guys have questions that, as they come up, you can throw your hand up in the air and we'll get a mic to you and you can, you can interject. Um, so so uh, Execution Labs is... Um, it's a bit of, a, of an odd duck, but we're an accelerator for indie game studios um, and based in, in Montreal, uh, although I'm based here in San Francisco. Um, and uh, what that means is each, uh, each year we run two, two sessions uh, for, for and we fund and support between four and six studios uh, per, per session. Um, and so that means we see a lot of different indie game studios. Uh, we also have a seed fund for uh, sort of larger indie indie studios to, uh, that's meant to help them finish whatever uh, game they're working on and actually ship that game. Um, so so what that means is we see a lot of a lot of indies. Uh, we do PC, we do console, we do mobile, we do free to play, we do premium, we see a lot. Um, but because we see that many indie studios on an annual basis, it allows us to um, start identifying trends. Right, um, and one of the trends that we have absolutely identified <laughs> that is common through almost every indie studio that we meet is that um, they tend to um, not want to think about marketing very much, um, or if they're okay thinking about it, um, they're not thinking about everything they should be thinking about. Um, or if they are really good about thinking about all the things they should be thinking about, um, they're not sure how to spend resources against it. And that means both money, but more importantly, time, right? Because most of the studios that we work with are, you know, four or five people, and, you know, resources are scarce, right? So um, that gave me the idea, why don't we assemble a panel of people who are experts on this stuff and help unpack it, right, and, and, and help, uh, help everyone understand how they have gone about it uh, in their different capacities. Um, so I'll let each of you guys do a full introduction. Um, we have Justin Bailey from Double Fine, Steve Escalante from Versus Evil, um, and Ken Cito from Massive Damage. Uh, so Toronto, sort of distributed, uh, and, and, and San Francisco. Um, so, uh, and I think this is an interesting group because Ken runs a studio, um, is the founder of a studio in Toronto, Versus Evil is an indie publisher, um, perhaps best known as publisher Banner Saga and some others. And Double Fine is uh, you know, one of the most successful indie studios that's out there. So with that, why don't I let each of you guys sort of give a more thorough introduction and then we can sort of dive into some, some questions. Sure, um, I'm Justin Bailey, uh, CEO of Double Fine. Um, for the last three years, I've been running the business side of stuff. Um, you guys are probably aware of Tim Schaefer. He loves to do the creative stuff and uh, likes to have uh, all the rest handled. So, uh, so that's what I've been doing. Um, what in what's included in that um, is like all the operations of the studio, all the publishing. Um, there is a initiative I started about a year and a half ago called Double Fine Presents, uh, which is about uh, bringing indies. Uh, there is no funding involved. It's literally just that Double Fine uh, introduces those indies to our community and also helps in the promotional side of things. Um, one small caveat, like from like my perspective of uh, what I'm going to give you guys is um, uh, we've been looking into ways to deploy marketing, uh, marketing dollars, and um, we are generally on the other side of things of like not spending any money whatsoever and using whatever social channels we can, um, as well as like kind of any any uh, promotional tricks. So uh, that's kind of been my focus, and very briefly been looking into how you can actually deploy a small amount of marketing dollars effectively and. I know Steve, I've actually uh, looked at some of the stuff he's done and um, has had some success in that, that area. That was a nice segue, thank you. 
<laughs> uh, Steve Escalante, I'm the founder of Versus Evil. Uh, we've published several indie titles now, uh, mainly premium across the board from PC, console, uh, and mobile as well. So the Banner Saga, Gilded Engineering uh, are a couple to mention. Uh, but yes, yeah, so basically we are an indie publisher from the point of somebody has their funding and we just help them out with marketing. We provide finishing funds or we'll fund a game uh, soup to nuts um, and do everything from project development to the whole nine yards. So we'll, I'm sure we'll get into some of the other details about uh, what we do. But yeah, we are almost predominantly business publishing and marketing focused. And we also just provide other services uh, as well, which is also uh, kind of getting back to Keith's earlier point of providing indies time. And that includes just offloading QA or offloading localization or some of those business sites focuses that I'm sure you do as well uh, that the dev teams don't want to really worry about as much. They just kind of want to be able to keep developing the game. So, but we'll get into that, some of the marketing stuff later. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Ken Seidel from uh, Massive Damage. Uh, I founded that company about uh, four and a half years ago. Our, our first game actually uh, did decently for us, got into top 100 grossing in the App Store a few times. Um, so, you know, able to get us a couple million dollars to sustain the company for the last little while. And uh, most recently, just completed a uh, successful Kickstarter for our next game, which is going to be on Steam, called Halcyon 6 Starbase Commander. So I raised like 189k on Steam, I'm uh, sorry, on Kickstarter, which in this this year of Kickstarter was actually pretty good. Like it's, you don't, you can't get as much money for a non-branded IP anymore. So, 200k is about where you want to hit if, if you're gonna get anywhere. Yeah, I, I think we'll we'll have a lot to say about uh, the role of, the role of Kickstarter and crowdfunding in general. Quick question: Who who in the room is doing um, mobile development? And who's doing? Um, is there anyone doing PC or console? Okay, a few. And who who's doing free to play and premium all right so, so we have a pretty good mix but not surprisingly the majority are, are, are mobile free to play um, Ken I, I, you have a really interesting perspective here um, you said something that is maybe surprising to most people which is that the last game you did was a top 100 grossing free -to mobile free to play free to play game, game yeah free to play game and now you're doing a premium PC title um, and you have to assume that sort of the the cost of marketing or the resources you could deploy against marketing had some impact on the decision to move from mobile to, to yeah basically we're at the at, at a point where the current the game that kind of helped build the studio uh is a it was a location-based zombie apocalypse game so the location-based angle definitely played well when we first launched with it uh, it got quite a bit of buzz um it's not so much uh, of a thing anymore these days um <clears throat> But uh, it's an older game, so it's like four years into its life cycle. Uh, and it's gotten to the point where you know we really can't do any kind of paid marketing for it. It doesn't make any sense. Like it's, it's just I don't know it, the way the game was built and the way it's been designed. The it, it's it's just where it is where, right now. So this um, PC game that I'm building is a bit of an experiment to see how creating a, hopefully, uh, knock on wood, a success on Steam, how that would translate to the App Store. Like, is that a reasonable uh, kind of pathway to getting uh, recognition on the App Store by establishing awareness and, and brand uh, on Steam first and on PC and Mac and console, I guess, yeah. So, so is that to say that sort of the, your sort of broader marketing strategies uh, the re you intend to make most of your money on mobile, or do you, th you think you'll make most of your money on PC and then use that just as? I think for this particular title, it'll probably be most of my money on on PC and and you know maybe a little bit on console, and then I think mobile will be an experiment to see if it's just like a double dip opportunity to sell like a f some copies on iPad, or if it if if it gets popular enough, if we can actually sustain a premium title on on the App Store. Uh, and have that be a significant force. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to yeah, yeah. So um, we did that exact thing with the Banner Saga, which is kind of goes against all my AAA training, if you will. Um, coming from Bethesda, we basically obviously it's like you launch all your SKUs at once, and you got to get it out there because you've got the biggest marketing push, and and uh, there certainly is strength with that. 
um, as a small indie studio with less funds, uh, what that strategy employed for us for Banner Saga was it allowed us to engage with the press in a meaningful way as opposed to just some little update or something that we did to our game. It was now the mobile version is out. Um, and that gave us a whole new surge of press, which was uh, other than our PR teams, I mean, mainly organic uh, to Justin's point earlier. It's like, what are the things that you can do to kind of get press and get marketing, get attention from whether the influencers or, or the press? And that was a way for us to kind of grow the brand. Banner Saga was marketed as a trilogy, so we know that we just want to keep growing that base so that when we launch Banner Saga 2 or Banner Saga 3, we have more and more players that are interested in the brand. And uh, we've looked at that as a strategy for most of our games now of saying, all right, um, it's okay for us to not spend a whole bunch of money uh, to do multiple SKUs because most of our teams are two guys, three guys, max. You know, So it's a lot for them to do a sim ship on mobile and PC or PC and console. So it's, it's okay for them just execute on the PC version. That will certainly be able to be shown to the Apples and Googles of the world and saying, look at this successful PC title, we're coming to mobile, what do you think? And it, it allows for a really good discussion with them. So for us, that's been a, a pretty good winning strategy. Um, if you were to talk to the Stoic guys, because we talk about this all the time, they would actually say they might have failed had they gone mobile first, based off of um, the premium model on mobile, they might have they might have actually not done as well and, and not been able to translate from mobile to PC. And, and Justin, you guys have also recently done two games, I think, that went from PC to, to mobile premium, right? Uh, we did. So we had Broken Age and then Grim Fandango, which uh, is Mark back there? There's Mark. He actually he did a lot of the work in Grim Fandango. Um, so, you know, we had that uh, strategy as well. We had about, um, we, we've actually done both. For, for Broken Age, we did it like day and date. Um, it was, it was uh, important because that's um, when we did our crowdfunding campaign, like we made a promise that that would be available. And so, um, so when the final game came out, we felt like that was, uh, we needed to live up to that promise. Um, on Grimm, we did about a three month delay. Um, actually, it was more than that, it was probably like four or five. Um, it, did, it did create another boost and uh, that, uh, was helpful, and you know we, you know having looked at both of them, um, I'd probably, um, I would say, you know if you have marketing dollars to spend, uh, I think uh, that would be um, a fine strategy to go ahead and do um, with with delaying it, and you get you get another press beat potentially. Um, for us, like the big bang approach is it works best because um, almost all of our efforts were promotional. Um, and around like PR and around uh, activating our um, our existing community and getting people talking about it, and so uh, because that's the case, um, you know, for us it was like we just did we we still do all SKUs basically at the same time. There's a lot in that answer that that, that I want to dive into a little bit. Um, so one of the things that sort of implied there, I think, is that you can there is sort of marketing to be done around a premium title on. Right, like, I mean, do, what what does that even really, really mean? I mean, is it just, hey, I want to have good relationships with Apple and Google, uh, Amazon, or is it? I mean, is there sort of marketing and the sort of way that we used to are used to thinking about it for, say, a premium PC title? Yeah, I mean, for us, it was mostly just getting featured, um, and we have those relationships, um, and that's something where, like indies, we know it's uh, <coughs> getting featured can make all the difference, and so um, if you don't have a brand that people are aware of yet, obviously it's really hard to get that feature. Um, but we were making like Double Fine Presents, the whole idea was to, to make those introductions. And it's like, it's already been vetted. Um, you know, our studio's already checked out uh, the creative side of things and it's something uh, that we think is special. And, and, and Steve, like when, when, with the Banner Saga, for example, um, did the fact that it was successful already before moving over to, to the uh, iPad, did that, make it easier for you to have those conversations? Oh yes, absolutely, and uh, just taking a quick step back, I mean, what Justin said is also really important is most indie teams don't have the pedigree that a Double Fine has, so they don't have a community that they can activate, and that's a, a huge strength, whether it's Double Fine Presents or just Double Fine, and what there's a reason why AAA companies do what they do. They're basically activating their users for the next Call of Duty or the next Battlefield, and they're keeping in that branded thing, establishing new IPs with new teams is really, really hard. And I think the indies are the only people really, truly doing that. Um, 
And it's a, but it's a very difficult thing because it's like, can these guys do it? Can these two, three people that aren't even in the same office? Like, it's those questions start getting asked. Is this going to be fun? It, how is it unique? So those things are really hard to kind of get in front of anyone to, to have a believability of delivering something fun and cool and, cr and creative. So yes, um, after we had essentially proven to the market because we had great press and with great reviews with the Banner Saga PC, it absolutely made that conversation easier because now it's credible. Now it's, yes, I can totally see this title coming to mobile, uh, it plays well, and those conversations were much easier. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult when it's brand new. Can these guys execute on this vision? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was absolutely a good strategy for us. Yeah, I mean, and just to talk about the Banner Saga just for a second, um, like that was very interesting for me because we launched Broken Age um, around, around the same time that Banner mm -hmm. Saga came out. And, um, that was the first part of Broken Age. Um, yep. So, and it was really interesting to us because we were neck and neck, um, mm -hmm. and I wasn't very familiar with the Stoic Studio guys, and it was actually, it, it caught me a little bit of a surprise because I was like, oh my gosh, how are they keeping up with Double Fine who has this brand awareness, um, already has an existing community and has so much press around this game? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, well, I, I don't know, if, are you okay if I ask the question? Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like what do you think, um, how do you guys think you're so <laughs> successful around marketing the title? Um, I, well, the Kickstarter phase that they had, which is similar to you guys as well, um, although you guys had a much bigger Kickstarter than they did, um, was Kickstarter was a different time. You know, now Kickstarter is a very different engine. It's much more of a pre-order engine, if you will, than it is, let's say, a funding engine. I mean, $184,000 is great today, but it doesn't necessarily fund, let's say, a million or $2 million project. So it's like a good start, good community builder. Um, so we, we basically had um, these three guys, ex-Bioware guys, and that helped. And um, Bioware actually even supported them socially as well. We also had some other guys that were kind of supporting us socially also. But it was just one of those things that they were kind of a Kickstarter darling, because at the time when they did their raise, I think it was in the top 3% of all raises. So they got great press from like the New York Times and things like that, because Kickstarter was just kind of getting going, and I think, I forget, did you guys launch after us or before? Uh, the w like launch the game? Kickstarter. Or the, oh, definitely. Uh, Double Fine did their crowdfunding campaign like before anybody else. It was right, the right. one that, that got Kickstarter on the map. Right. Yeah. So. Um, in games at least. Right. Actually kind of in everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so it was, um, it was probably arguably one of the, the next bigger ones, and, and it, it just kind of gave, gave us a lot of press, and people were watching. Because everybody was watching Kickstarter, like, are these guys going to deliver? What's this new platform? What does it What does it do? So that gave us a really good start. What we were able to do is just amplify that voice. So they just went from having, you know, we just inserted our PR teams and things like that. So I would say the the Bioware um, connection helped establish them as a studio because it was always mentioned in every single article. The three X Bioware guys, mm -hmm. um, the Kickstarter raise, which was uh, like almost twenty two thousand backers. Uh, that was a big uh, help as well. And then basically the game and the visuals just really kind of stuck out as well. It was something really pretty unique, and, and I think people look really responded to that. So um, we just had great success with that. And, and as you start reaching out to press, some of these press guys, you know, you find out that they're backers, and then you're like, oh. So, you know, they're, they're just gamers too, and, and um, I think that also helped. But we, um, we just kind of put... We, we had a much thinner budget than we have even on some of our other titles now, and a lot of it was just PR focused and based off of the quality of the game. So um, that was able to kind of help us because we had, I think, over 400 reviews um, during that those first two weeks of launch. Uh, so again, there's a, a lot in that response that I think uh, bears discussion. One of the things that you sort of threw out there as sort of a given uh, was that Kickstarter is, um, you know, it's a pre tool, it's not a funding tool, uh, and that's almost common knowledge now, or sort of accepted wisdom, but uh, most consumers don't know that, right? Like, I mean, most consumers think that, you know, they gave Ken $185,000, and he's going to be able to make this amazing, you know, <laughs> this amazing game, and Ken's probably thinking that's nowhere close to, to, to what I need to raise. Um, also, I mean, and this, this discussion is meant to talk about, uh, you know, sort of resources, internal resources. That campaign, from a cost standpoint, it's I mean, yes, you didn't spend money on it, but like you're what 10, 12 people in your studio, right? Uh, 11 people, yeah. 11 people. So, I mean, 
can you talk about like what that costs in terms of manpower to get that campaign up and running and manage? Yeah, we actually took a very well. <coughs> I took a very <coughs> excuse me. Um, kind of analytical approach to uh, creating that campaign. I basically uh, took a look at all the successful game Kickstarter campaigns from only within the last year or so, because I thought anything that was before that is a different time period, a different atmosphere on Kickstarter. So I didn't really want to uh, uh, mess up the data with games that just weirdly did like 800K based on two screenshots. So that's not helpful. Um, so I, I basically put everything on a spreadsheet uh, it was months of preparation before the campaign launch. It was mostly uh, me and the artist and my producer, um, probably about part time for about three months um, before the campaign launch. And then about a month before the campaign launch, it was full time. And then during the campaign, all three of us were basically full time, revamping all our stretch goals, uh, just working on stuff, content just for the updates. So we were actually like, it's almost like a, you had to care and feed uh, for the campaign as it was live, because just to make sure everybody understood how like, how present you were and, and, and to give them the assurance that you know, you're know you an actual company, not two guys in a basement who just throw something up on the screen and hope people put money in there. Like the, Having that quick response to comments and messages was definitely uh, creating that trust with uh, our backers and also creating, like I said, the update for the contents to, to show them that you know, we're continually working on um, just fleshing out what we're actually gonna build for them. Um, that, that came in, like I felt like our campaign reflected uh, all that effort. There's a lot of things. And do you guys have a dedicated sort of marketing uh, or community person, uh, or is it basically you doing a lot of It's, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think th I, most indies, I think, have that same situation, right, where it's like, someone is either not designing or not coding or not drawing and they are sort of community managers for a long time when, you know, when these kind of things happen. Um, and, and community management broadly is something that you guys have all sort of alluded to, but I mean, that is a huge component of marketing now for, for any indie, uh, you know, a mobile console, to whatever. And it is a potentially ginormous resource drain, right? Um, and so, I mean, you guys are a big, a big, uh, a big studio for, for an indie. You guys are sort of medium size for an indie. I would say, you know, maybe on the small side. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious, Steve. Like, when you guys do publishing deals with indie studios, do you offload that community management aspect, or can you do that? Really, how does it work? We uh, sometimes. So everything we do is kind of a la carte. So some developers don't want to um, be disconnected from that and there's certainly value in staying connected. Um, if we do take on community management, which we do quite a bit, um, obviously we need to make sure that we take on their voice so that it's not something that is unauthentic. But we, we're so involved with the, with the game, it, uh, there's a lot of we talking instead of you and us, and you, and, uh, you or I, and this is your game or whatever. It is their game, but at the same time, we all, we're all gamers, so we get really pretty passionate about it as well. But most of the community management stuff, uh, that we do uh, because we don't necessarily have huge signups and things because again these are all new teams is just making sure we manage all the steam and retailer accounts and, and making sure that we're getting questions answered there because most of those are really kind of product focused as opposed to you know tell us a little bit more about your studio if they do and we, we just kind of point them in the right direction uh, but yeah it is a it's a pretty big um, thing that we do whether we do a reddit AMAs and and getting and building that community for them, but yeah, we will run that with because uh, a lot of times it's it's just time. Again, two or three guys, um, it takes it takes guys out of the way of the studio. Uh, one day is is a lot, you know. If with Stoic, if you remove John, well then you just lost your entire engineering team. <laughs> and then if Arnie has to do something else, then well the art's not being worked on today. I mean, it's those are big things. Like the entire art department just went away for the day, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, what you're hearing here, and say we had we kind of went over to crowdfunding for a little bit, but um, it's the components to make up marketing. I think everybody in this room understands that community is a is a huge component, very powerful, something that uh, needs to be leveraged uh, as much as possible for indies. Um, and then 
know, on top of that, which is uh, I'm very interested in, and we're kind of at early days of this, is figuring out how you combine the community um, with actual uh, marketing spend, and um, specifically a marketing spend that's not like in the half million tab uh, cat you know, territory, um, which I think is the war chest that uh, if you guys are making indie games, especially in mobile and um, free to play, you know, you're competing with people who have that kind of, uh, that money to spend. Um, and so, you know, I would, I, I think what's resonating here, at least what, what I'm kind of picking up on, and um, consequently it's the same thing that'll help you if you guys, if anybody decides to do crowdfunding, um, is the idea of having this community. Um, and if you look into, like, say, so when you, when you build a community, it, it takes, like, uh, we're doing this right now, we have um, this one independent developer who has amazing potential. Um, I, I assume a lot of you people would, would know them. They just graduated from, from college, but you know, got a lot, of, uh, a lot of fanfare, but they have like, no community. And so um, we're helping them in the, the ways of community management and you know, just, I mean, simple stuff. Like, it, it sounds simple to everybody, but everybody should be doing this, is obviously getting your Twitter accounts together, getting your Tumblr. Um, you know, basically starting to do blog posts, uh, you know, attending show, trade shows like this, um, getting plugged into the indie crowd, making those connections uh, um, with other game developers who, you know, can get inspired by your game, uh, getting their feedback so that they actually are, you know, um, they are actually helping promote your game when it comes out because, you know, they feel like vested, they want you to succeed. And so um, all these things I think are, are really important. And then um, once you have that, then you have the basis to start doing some marketing things um, like the things we're looking into is like defining a custom audience, and so you know, for example, it'd be um, if you if you can basically you know state who the people who would like your game are, go onto Facebook, um, do some Facebook ads, uh, put those uh, put those demographics in there, and then you have like a highly focused um, group that you can market to, and so the, you know the, the you can deploy five to ten thousand dollars, which I'm assuming would probably be what you guys are um, you know what what a lot of indies have to spend on marketing. Um, and then and then see get the get the analytics back and see if it was an effective spin. We do that a lot as well. I mean, um, a great example is you know Sean the Sheep just launched and Armacrog is a uh, hand sculpted clay game, stop motion animated, which looks very much like a Sean the Sheep f uh, film. So same thing. It's like you have this audience that really likes both film and gaming. That's really like there's very few uh, creative projects that are being done in this way, whether it's film or gaming. So then when we did our targeted Facebook ads, it's the same thing. It's like, well, we're going after these people. And even though it's really segmented, we also know that they're fans of kind of stop motion. You know, so it's, we, can, we can target that and say, if you like this, you'll probably like that. And we do that to the extent, I mean, um, you can really get granular. You can go wide, which I wouldn't suggest, because th th when you're looking at a community, um, for us, it's like, Organizing five or 10,000 people, those are kind of big numbers because that's a great catalyst for you to then hopefully have them and their friends kind of go from there and keep going and growing. And you can build on a small catalyst of well-informed, organized fans that like your stuff and you can hit their Facebook pages and things and, and you can do so inexpensively. You can help boost even your D YouTube views as well with small spends, just little boosts. Everybody has done it and it's not it's not like you're having a bunch of people click play. So you're not getting, it's just more, it's almost like a Facebook ad. It's like, here's this video, and if people click through and go to it, then you're, you're just maybe or maybe not getting a view. There's nothing uh, different about just posting it up on YouTube. So, and you kind of want to get those things that were as organically kind of growing as well. So you kind of help with some of your media spends. But those aren't big spends. Um, even just sharing posts, tweets, things like that, you can boost those posts and kind of cross cross promote those across other games and target those for very little money. Um, you can spend 15, 20 bucks, 50 bucks, depending on a post or a tweet, and reach hundreds if not thousands, depending on, you know, your targeting. So, the more targeting you specifically get, actually, is the more expensive it can be, but you're also getting a much more qualified customer as well. So it just depends on reach. Yeah. Um, Sorry, um, if you have a question, I think we have a mic that we can we can give you so that you show up on the on the recording when when people. Uh, we have one floating in the audience. Thanks. Um, and someone mentioned uh, dub, Double Fine pre Presents. I was curious, how many have you uh, processed currently, and what have you learned from them? Yeah, great question. Uh, we have three. So um, we have, uh, and they're all at different stages, and we did that on purpose to kind of get some data on it. So the first one we did was a scapegoat uh, two. And so we were like, okay, it's a sequel. It's kind of a known indie. 
um, and we just help out with press, like literally right before the game shipped, uh, we did the press. Uh, the second one was uh, Sam Farmer, Last Life. Uh, it was a crowdfunding campaign, and we, you know, his original goal was like 40,000, and through being involved with Double Fine, was able to top over 125,000. Um, so that we were seeing if we could actually effectively um, you know, move the bar in a crowdfunding campaign to get, you know, get his, what, what he needed to get the game done. Um, and that was a you know, huge success uh, in, in you know, how we defined it. And the third one was Gang Beasts, uh, which is an interesting one because like, literally like, uh, you know, major players were going after that game to try to sign it up. Um, and then when we interacted back and forth, we were just like, hey, just, um, you know, let's, we got the code in front of Tim, got the, f the code in front of some of our other creative, uh, um, you know, creative directors, like our art director and our design director at Double Fine, and then gave them feedback, and that was it. And we're like, here you go, here's our feedback of what we think can make this game better. Um, and they went with us and, you know, turned down huge amounts of money um, to, to go with us, because that feedback, they said, was so, was so valuable from a, a fellow peer. Um, and, um, you know, that one, so we started early on, that's probably, you know, looking at it, that's, that's where um, the sweet spot is for the program going forward, um, because it actually gives us a chance to help them in creating their community. Um, and doing a lot of things that up to the buildup of their launch would help the game sell better. Um, and then we could activate our press and, um, you know, help make the connections to get them featured like they needed to. And so, um, yeah, that was, that's the model going forward now. I just want to back up a little bit um, because we're talking about, so far, about once you have a game that is essentially ready to launch and you're, or, or you know, maybe early stage and you're doing Kickstarter, there's, and that's more sort of traditional uh, B2C, you know, b business to consumer marketing where you're trying to get people, uh, consumers to pay attention. But if we can just for a few minutes talk about when it makes sense to spend marketing resources to get um, other businesses to pay attention. Usually other businesses means a publisher, um, usually it means a first party. So if you're, if you're very early stages and you're trying to get funding for your game, right? There's a certain amount of marketing that has to happen so that that can eventually occur. Now, most of the people in this room, or at least you know, two thirds of you are doing mobile and most of you are doing free to play. So you have to spend a certain amount of marketing resources, for example, to get the game to a point where a publisher will even talk to you because most publishers in mobile, for example, won't, won't even talk to you until the game is, is live and you have, have some metrics. Um, can I mean, since you've done some, some free-to-play, I mean, you self-published, right? So, like, if you were to do another free-to-play game, like, how, how m would you think about building the game or how much would you spend on sort of the marketing, getting the game ready to a point where you can then show it to a publisher? Well, um, I think we're a little lucky in, in Canada in that there's quite a few government programs that help uh, kind of uh, get some stuff off the ground beforehand. But if you're not as... Uh, lucky located as we are. Um, I think from what I've seen with publishers uh, that are in the free-to-play space, um, I don't know what you would do if you were just like the first time indie developer uh, where, you know, I can walk up to a publisher and say, look, you know, we did this game that, you know, made, made us over two million dollars. Um, we've learned a lot about how to run a free-to-play game. So you can kind of bring all that up to bear. So if you have that background, that's definitely a way to go if you're trying to get funding from a publisher. Uh, funny, going from the get-go, I think you need to start probably just um, um, getting like a prototype that is showing something really unique. I think the, the, the free-to-play space now, it's just, it is really difficult to do really well. And I think what's gonna stand out is, you know, not another clone. like. You Nobody wants to hear another clone pitch. They want to see something that they haven't seen before. They want to see artwork that is immediately, like, creates a reaction that is more than just, well, you know, you want, it, it just, the, the artwork we did for, for our game, Halcyon 6, um, we did multiple passes uh, on it. And the first pass that we did, when we first started creating the concept, like, it looks nothing like what it looks like today. Like the, our first pass looked like Space Quest, like literally Space Quest back from 1980s or whatever. But um, the current version 
has gone through so many iterations and it, and now has like I show you, if I were to show you a screenshot you'd be like wow like that's your first that's your first reaction and that's that's kind of what you want so if you're if you're working on a game and you're not getting the artwork or something in the gameplay that immediately creates that reaction you're gonna have a pretty tough time getting anybody to pay attention to you uh, before or after you create the game and, and Steve from from developers who are working on PC or console titles that may be looking for a publisher to come pick up pick up the game and, and fund it I mean what how much time do they spend on you know developing assets that they can take to trade shows uh, you know how do you decide uh, you know which shows I'm gonna go to do I go to booths do I set up a booth do I have you know what do I do like I, I mean what do you like to see I mean I don't know if it really w what I want to see is as much as uh, uh, let me just agree with Ken real quick first too, though, which is you got to have that hook. Um, whether it's graphically, uh, graphic, graphical will go so far though too. It's like, well, w we launched Kin, which is a, a, a an action RPG, and it's done by two guys. It's a huge game, 20 to 30 hours worth of gameplay, and a lot of the press were like, well, it's not Diablo. I'm like, yeah, it's two guys, <laughs> you know, and but because they went with a higher quality graphics, and we were kind of amazed by it. But like, we, we got to help these guys. This is this is amazing what they've been able to do with two guys, and um, but we c it was a challenge to kind of get over the hump. It's like, well, because you look this good, but you're not that. It's like, yes, we're two guys, and th this is an amazing indie title. This is an amazing team. What these guys have done, so you still have to have that hook that kind of also builds the gap, um, and and people can kind of latch onto. It's like, oh, okay, great. Um, so that's a really, really important thing to have, whether you're pre-launch or launch, because once we start kind of getting into that marketing and PR m uh, machine, they're going to want to know what that is. And um, the two guys thing is indie, so that doesn't go very far, unfortunately. So it's just you just still have to have that kind of unique hook. But to answer your question with PC and console, um, you know, uh, just putting on your indie hat, whether you're working with us or yourself, I mean, the one thing that we have found, which is something that we had a hard time kind of in, in with all my years of marketing, is always justifying an ROI of going to an event. Um, but what I will say now today on the indie side of things is going to those events, while it can have an economic hit on you, w could introduce you to a lot of very important people. One, your fans, which is great because you can, you can organize them potentially locally. But two, there's a lot of influencers and press there that you can meet. And we've done that as a as an indie publisher, all of a sudden we're like, oh, you know, we've we've met some very very big influencers that have liked our stuff, and for us, that was it was worth it just for that, just to go to that show for that. So it's if you can get those guys engaged, those people, I can tell you, the influencer and YouTube audience is a very big deal for indie titles, and sometimes the only way that you're going to get in front of them because they are so busy, the good ones. They're so busy that um, if you can get in front of them in, in a trade show or something like that, it's a big deal. So for us, it's the same thing. You, you know, you basically need to show some sort of gameplay. Uh, it's very rare that we'll sign something off of a design doc. So um, we have, but uh, I think we're like one of the last people that will. Um, but you know, we need to see that that sweat equity and, and basically find out what that hook is, and that's going to be shown through some sort of vertical slice and some obviously a graphical look as well. Even if it's early on graphics, and they say yes, but this is where we're going, we've been in the space long enough that we will believe that, so that's okay. We, but we still want to kind of see what that hook is. So whether it's PC console or mobile, I think that argument or is there regardless. I just want to add a little something to what I was saying regarding graphics. I, I, don't, I don't mean necessarily that it has to have high-end graphics or AAA graphics. I think I, didn't, I meant like the art direction like should be uh, unique and eye-catching eye and, and, and evocative. I think that's more important than how high fidelity the graphics are. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like Banner Saga is a perfect example yeah. of that. Banner Saga, Gilded so. Engineering with that hand-drawn kind of look, if you haven't yeah. checked it out. It's, there's nothing high end about that, but it works. It works really well. I like how all the little items are on them. Yeah. yeah. Like it yeah. Doesn't little much, little touches. Yeah. 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 You you talked just briefly about the streamers and let's play guys. I mean, aside from sort of having you know you bump into them at a conference, or whatever. Is it? Do you guys spend resources on sort of trying to figure out who these guys are? Uh, I mean. Seems like obvious answer, yes, by your by your by your response. But I'd like you guys to talk about that because it's you know probably a little different for each of you guys. Yeah, I mean, it, for us it was kind of interesting because the it goes back to the gang beast. Um, like 
they were actually doing that better than Double Fine was. Um, they have a game that allows for that because it's like procedural animation, and they like had a, a great list of uh, of uh, you know Let's Play people they reached out to, uh, and Twitch streamers, and uh, they actually helped augment our list. But it was interesting because when we from that engagement, we actually figured out how like we started treating them just like we treat press and having a press list and having like an influencer, um, you know, Twitch Let's Play list. Um, and so now we, we, you know, are forming relationships with them. And, you know, I think um, in some regards that is a, a very effective channel to concentrate on, um, you know, depending on the style of game. I think uh, obviously with Gang Beasts work amazing um, with a content-based game like uh, Broken Age, um, you could literally just watch the whole story play out that took like three years to craft, but, but still, um, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we, we do the same thing. So uh, in the past, uh, we had more of our traditional AAA hats on. It's like, yeah, the PR, we have our press list and things like that. But now uh, the influencer crowd and the Let's Play guys and the Twitch guys are all very, uh, very important. And they're both very different. You know, there, there's the lifetime guys which are playing Gang of Beasts, let's say, for however many hours. We had some guys who are playing Gilded Engineering for seven, eight hours straight, which was awesome. But it's also in the moment versus let's say a YouTube video which will live for a while and will continue to drive people because people are subscribing to that channel but they're just not there at that day. And people need to remember that too just from an overall PR point of view is yes you got press but we're customers there on the site that day, that week because stories are coming in so fast that you get pushed down. So you kind of can't afford to not do both because you want the Let's Plays and the YouTubers, and then you get reminded because they went to their favorite site and they saw an article about it too, and like, oh yeah, that's right, I, I totally watch, loved ha watching that guy play the game. So it's it's all of those things kind of put together, but um, also just be conscious, if I can just kind of give uh, advice as well, of make sure you're targeting the right people. You don't want to send a first person shooter, Let's Play guy, the Banner Saga. He's just not interested and probably won't like it. Although there are some people that have said, I know I play Minecraft all day, but I'm gonna play this game because I'm breaking out of the mold and I just want to because I, I really want to play this game. Even though their whole audience is, let's say, based off of Minecraft. But my point is just let's make sure you're targeted. Send it to the RPG guy or the shooter guy or at that, um, at that outlet, whether it's press or uh, Twitch or what have you. Make sure you're targeting the people, know what they play, because otherwise it's, it's just going to be noise to them and they have a lot already. Yeah, and what's your thought, and can you can answer this too, about those guys who are focused on mobile, right? Because a lot of the developers in the room are mobile. I, I mean, uh, it seems like there's more and more guys playing mobile stuff, but I don't know, have, wh what have you found? Uh, yeah, I did a little bit of research into it. There's There are some guys who are doing Let's Play uh, on like mobile games, but it's a s much smaller amount. So I don't think it has as much of a big impact on mobile as <coughs> if you're creating a traditional Steam game on PC in terms of uh, the influence. I wanted to touch base on um, what you said earlier about uh, the ROI on coming to conferences like this. I think as a um, <coughs> um, to the indie guys here who are you know, putting their hard earned money coming to a conference like this, um, something that I did um, to make the most value out of these conferences, I've been coming to GDC and Casual Connect for the last few years. Uh, I'll give you a direct result of what, how I capitalized on that. Like this is a poor choice of words, but I guess I did. Um, I had all these stacks of business cards from all the other developers and just general people that I met at each of the conferences, organized by stack, by event. Um, so one of the things I did for my Kickstarter on day one um, of the Kickstarter, I hand wrote basically about 200 plus emails. Uh, and I don't remember everybody, obviously, it's impossible, but because I knew which stack they were in, it's like, hi, Bob, nice to meet you at GDC. And as I remember, I told you about how CN6, well, the Kickstarter is on today. Here's a click button link to sh tweet to share. Uh, if you can't, you know, if you can't back it or not interested in this game, that's cool. You know, here's these easy to click buttons that you can use to, to sp help me spread the word. And, and I did like 200 of those emails because I you know, did the legwork when I was at a conference. And uh, so I would recommend if you guys are here now, like definitely make sure you're collecting business cards, meeting people, especially the, 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 the guys at like the Indie Prize and stuff like that, because a huge chunk of people who are my backers are other game developers. I keep meeting people who are like, yeah, I backed your games, like, yeah, awesome. Like it's, 
Yeah, uh, it's just, it, they make up for a decent chunk, and they're actually much more vocal than you might expect because you know they usually end up running their own uh, Twitter account for their for their studio, so they'll help retweet some of your stuff. Like it's just there's a there's a nice little kind of halo effect from that, and it can't be ignored. Yeah, I mean that it's very important that. The way people think of like uh, a tool like Kickstarter um, and crowdfunding when you do it is like you're bringing the whole community. Like Kickstarter, like is a it is a platform to help you organize your community. There is no organic discovery happening on Kickstarter. Um, it is you know up to 97 percent of all the traffic being driven there is driven by the developer, and that's why th what you've done is so important. Is like making these connections with other developers, getting invested in your in your game, um, act, helping activate them, and that—that's a big thing, by the way. Is just like make it easy on the people who you've met before to help support you um, by, you know, writing up the tweets that you want them to do, or um, you know, sending something to them to ask them to retweet or something like that. That's really important. If all they have to do is push a button to help, you know, promote your game, um, and that's awesome. If they actually have to write, you know, a sentence or two, there's going to be drop off. So, um, I think that's really important to remember. Yeah, the, the Skyshine guys, we signed Skyshine Bedlam, um, and their Kickstarter, they did that. It's like, I want to go to Bedlam. That was it. It was, and they would send that out to a lot of people and just say, if you can tweet this, post this, here's a link to our Kickstarter. Um, all you have to say is, I want to go to Bedlam. That's it. <laughs> and if they wanted to add more, they could, but it was really pretty simple. They kind of gave them what they were looking for, and um, and you can, they shared with me the data afterwards, and, and it was like, yeah, you can see when they had these industry guys either do a Kickstarter backer update or something like that on their page, you could see the effect that it had. There's a question yeah, over here. Question over here. Hi, uh, Mitchell Pignol, Roboto Games. Uh, working on an indie title, which is not really indie, um, as in it's not targeted at what most people think of as the indie community. Um, I'm making a casual puzzle game. Uh, which so far seems to attract mostly women uh, who are, you know, 45 and up. So how would you market to them? Because other than buying Facebook ads, which is really expensive. Any tips on that? Hmm. Yeah, I mean the first thing that comes to mind is like, <laughs> have you talked to Zynga? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, that's that obviously that, uh, that demographic was uh, activated pretty well with the social games that Zynga did, so. Um, it's, it's interesting because like it would be I'd probably get in touch with somebody who actually used to work at Zynga and ask them um, what they did. I don't have any actual. Is it a, is it a mobile title or is it a? It's mobile. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I think sort of the um, the sort of muted <laughs> relative muted response is it's um, a result of the fact that marketing for mobile games to any demographic um, is really really tough, uh, particularly without a publisher. Um, and you know, most of my recommendations these days to indies, uh, like let me rephrase, 100% of my recommendations to indies on mobile is to stop doing it. Um, and because the marketing resources just aren't there. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily apply to a premium title, um, because, but you're faced with a different situation, which is that your audience is much smaller. Um, but I think the grim reality, and if you've been around the conference for the last few days, is that um, you know entering the mobile space now for a casual title is incredibly, incredibly expensive for most people. Yeah, I also don't want to discourage you as well. I mean, you know, there there are um, part of the reason why women are, are such a big force in, in gaming and online gaming is because of the aim chats and things like that. You get these stay-at-home moms that were playing games like Candy Crush and others that were there, or they were some of the best guild managers in MMOs, So, which is part of my past history. But you would find that women were some of the strongest motivators out of, even though they, at the time they were kind of a smaller percentage, they were the best guild leaders. And they can motivate and, and, and get their audiences and their friends and everybody into a room. Um, so my suggestions would be just try to do some outreach. I mean, look at Wiggy, the uh, Women's in Games uh, whole organization. There's a lot of really strong uh, leadership there that they actually might be able to help and influence, whether it's within their own channels um, or um, others that they can suggest and do introductions. Um, but again, l thinking about that targeted press and PR, there are many uh, very strong uh, 
uh, women gamers that are that are press or, or influencers and reach out. Um, if it's going to appeal to them, then you know reach out. You know, and it, obviously you're going to have to have that hook of of why because you don't want to say, well, it appeals to women. That's why I'm talking to you. It still needs to hit them as a gamer. Um, and that's where you have to be careful with any demographic. Cause it's like, well, it's an RPG, so I'm going to focus on this thing. It's like, well, it's not nearly as clear cut as that. Because if it was, then it'd actually be more expensive than it is to, to market on Facebook. But um, yeah, and, and and sort of to add a little more constructive advice to, to my response, you, you you can there are publishers who do those kinds of games, right? And you can find them. <laughs> Shameless plug here. I publish for that audience. We should talk. See, there you go, right? <laughs> so my advice would be, I mean, do those things. Try to get an audience, and maybe you have the game live, and you're getting some good metrics. Then go show them to a publisher and say, hey, look what I have. And then let them sort of offload the, the, the heavy lifting. Um, I, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, well, I just wanted to tell you, we have a couple minutes, so I think yeah. we have like room for one or two more questions. Hey guys, uh, first thing, uh, I'm a proud backer of Banner Saga, Massive Chalice, and Brocade. Thank so you. Thank you for supporting. I said you you said in the beginning that that's most a pre-order, but for me, it's just helping these games that you are unique to bring to life. And this question is more for Justin. Uh, do in the market side, do you think all this open development that Broken Age showed of Double Fine? Was worth it for you guys? Do you think it gave some damage for your image? And you guys are open to do that again? For me as a developer, all the money that I invested was the documentary. I really loved the game, yeah. but the, the documentary for me was like, everything was paid for that, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, the two player guys, they're outstanding. Um, they do an amazing job. Um, I gotta tell you, like it was three years of watching the sausage be made, so. Um, which was awesome to be a part of, um, but it was like, I mean, we, we did deliver on, you know, our mandate to give people a, a, a view into what actual game development is like. Um, I think coming out of that, you know, um, we, you know, one of our, I, I think one of our biggest mistakes is to have made that behind a paywall instead of just making it available to everybody. And uh, I would say even that, though that was uh, in some, some ways a painful experience, um, in some ways it was like the highest highs, the lowest lows, um, but coming out of it, we're like, we want to do that in the future, and we want to make uh, that more of um, more of what the standard is, is to be visible and to show what's going on. And I think one of the things, if you watch that documentary, you'll walk away with, is the fact that um, it's really, games aren't a pre-order um, when you do like crowdfunding campaigns. Like they really are, it's different than everything else. Like we're actually, it is funding game development. All of their crowdfunding actually is, there's a product, for the most part, it's at the end of that product's, um, like, uh, you know, they've already developed it. Their campaign has put, a, like, a minimum order that they're trying to fulfill. It goes out within a few months. And, um, you know, I think um, having stuff like Double Fine being out there is, is has, um, and Broken Age has, has, has basically shown, um, you know, this, this is a process. And I think it's done a lot in favor of helping keep crowdfunding um, viable. Because I think if you didn't have that transparency, uh, the expectations of consumers and the people buying, like it would have already like you know collapsed upon itself. <coughs> Did I answer all your questions? Because there's three. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I think it's about time we need to wrap it up. I'm sure we could talk for a few more hours because you guys provide amazing insights. But uh, we need to clear the stage for the next speaker. Uh, if you guys have any more questions for these guys, try to grab them outside the, spe uh, the, the, the speaker room. And uh, thank you so much, guys. Cool.